Good morning, everyone, or good afternoon, depending on what part of the country you're tuning in from. Uh, thank you all for signing in for today's webinar on radon and new construction for part nine residential housing. Uh, my name is Mark. I'm going to be your webinar host for today. Mark Rosen with Building Knowledge, uh, and I'm here with Bruce Decker, who's going to be our main speaker today. Uh, we've got about an hour and a half for today's webinar. We're going to start with a few introductions. So I'd like to start by uh, just introducing, first off, from Enbridge, Susan Tadihi, who is the Supervisor of Strategic Builder Relations, to say a few words on Enbridge's behalf. Susan? Thanks, Mark. So um, just wanted to take a moment to thank everybody for joining today. Uh, very interesting topic. And we do have a lot of interested participants. So uh, just wanted to maybe move to the next slide and we'll go through a couple of uh, startup, our traditional acknowledgement. Um, what we'd like to start today's session by is acknowledging that the land on which we gather is the traditional and historical lands of the original people of Turtle Island, who have been the caretakers of these lands since time immemorial. So today, these gathering place that we know as home is also home to many First Nation, Métis, and Inuit peoples. And our acknowledgement of this reminds us that our great standard of living is directly related to the resources of and relationship to Indigenous peoples. And we have a responsibility to honor that. So we'll go to the next slide, Mark. So just a couple of quick reminders, uh, very busy time. We know that it's uh, time for construction heat, starting to get cold, a lot of questions, a lot of uh, builder related questions. Just wanna remind everybody that's out there that we have two uh, separate call centers at Enbridge. One is specifically designed to assist builders and HVACs. You have your own attachment center and the numbers appearing on the screen. So if you have any issues related to new gas services, using the online tool, anything to do with a new project, subdivision, new mains, meter sets, uh, your final inspections or gaining construction heat, please remember that there's a separate attachment center for you. If there is other customer care related issues that you need help with, caught up, cut off at mains and demolitions, anything to do with billing, damage meters or safety violations, there's a separate call center specifically for that. So uh, just a quick reminder so that you can get the attention and the service you need uh, as fast as possible. So we'll go to the next slide. And just a quick reminder as well, lots and lots happening on sites these days. Um, and what you do if you damage a natural gas line or back into a meter, et cetera. Uh, just remember, four steps, stop work, clear everyone from the area, call 911 if you smell or hear gas escaping, and then call the emergency uh, Enbridge line, which is there at the 5427 number. So we know everybody's busy. We know we're working at the speed of sound, but we want everybody to be safe and uh, and come home well to your families at the end of the day. So with that, we'll go to the next slide. And I believe I'm going to hand it back over to Mark Rosen to start the uh, the webinar for today. Mark. Thank you very much, Susan. So a very straightforward agenda for us today. As you see on screen, we're just going to continue with a couple of introductions and a little bit of housekeeping. And uh, then we're gonna get right into it and give Bruce the floor for the bulk of the time today. Uh, we will be saving some time at the end of today's session, about 15 minutes for Q&A. And we'll go over where to put those questions as we go. So we will be holding questions until the end, just to make sure that we leave enough time to get through all of the great content that Bruce has for us today. So by way of introduction, as I mentioned, my name is Mark Rosen. I'm the Director of Building Science uh, with Building Knowledge Canada. We host these webinars uh, quite frequently, so we're happy to see you all on here again. Um, all of this material in the bios will be going out with the slide decks to all of our registrants after the session, so I won't read through it today. Uh, but my email has been posted in the chat. If you have any questions for me to follow up from today's presentation, please don't hesitate to reach out. Uh, and the main act for today, Bruce Decker, is with BGIS. 
Uh, Bruce comes to us with over 14 years of experience in the radon industry and over nine years of experience as a board member uh, for KARST, which is the Canadian Association of Radon Scientists and Technologists. Uh, but all of that aside, uh, Bruce asked me to introduce him as a self-described radon nerd, and I think he's going to bring a lot of his passion for this topic uh, to us today. So thank you very much for be being here with us today, Bruce. A few housekeeping uh, and rules of engagement uh, rules for us to go over today. Uh, if you have any questions, as I mentioned, please put them in the Q&A section of the Zoom call, uh, specifically in the Q&A section if you would like us to get to your questions at the end instead of the chat. This just helps us and the admin team at BKC keep track of the questions to make sure we have them all in one place for ease of access. Uh, but we do encourage you to engage with the chat. Uh, be considerate and thoughtful, please, uh, and respectful of others in the chat, and make sure that we hold that just for side discussion, or if you have any technical challenges. Uh, the BKC admin team is standing by to help. If you have any issues with the sound or the video or connection issues uh, that we can help with, please put it in the chat, and Emma and Stacey are standing by to help with that. After today's webinar, there will be a SurveyMonkey link sent out, and we ask that you please complete it. It's, it's short and sweet, uh, but it does help us try to plan these for the future and ensure we can get uh, the best possible product delivered to you, all as registrants and audience members. So we uh, appreciate you taking the time to do that for us. Uh, and also, all of the links and presentation materials will be sent out to attendees following the webinar once we've had a chance to wrap that all up on our end. Uh, and finally, last bit of housekeeping, uh, closed captioning has been enabled for this webinar. Uh, if it's something that you would like to turn on for your benefit, you can find it uh, at the bottom of most screens. It's located between the record and reactions buttons on your webinar uh, controls, and you can click to turn on closed captioning uh, if you so desire. Before we get into the main content, just wanted to make you all aware of a couple of other upcoming webinars. Uh, First on November 30th, we have Gord Cook presenting on net zero ready homes and big exhaust appliances, something we, we see quite often uh, being questioned and, and lots of good information coming in that webinar. And then on December 14th, we have a webinar with a, a great uh, panel of speakers to talk about large building air tightness testing, which is a very fast growing industry. And they'll be sharing some lessons learned from experience in the field on that. Uh, links to register for those webinars will be shared in the chat and are also available on Building Knowledge Canada's website. So I look forward to seeing many of you on those calls as well. And lastly, before we get started, just a couple of polls so we know who we're talking to today. Uh, so you'll see these pop up on your screen. And if we can get you to answer uh, as many people as possible, where are you tuning in from? We know that uh, radon is uh, not very uh, localized. You know, it doesn't care where you are. It wants to, to get at you no matter where you live in the country. So it'd be great to see what our distribution of uh, attendees is today. I see we've got over 130 people signed in on the call today. So tell us where you're calling in from. Uh, we've got all of the provinces and territories and even the US or other. See if we get any international attendees on today's call. I see the responses are rolling in. And here we go. So a lot of attendees from Ontario. That's excellent. A lot of housing starts in Ontario. So good to see that. A few out on the West Coast and from the Atlantic as well. So it looks like we're spanning from sea to sea today. So that's great. And our second poll, what keeps you busy? What is your kind of day-to-day -day, uh, work look like? Uh, are you in the building industry? Are you in the design side of that? Do you support from the energy side? Other consultants? Uh, are you involved in HVAC maybe or ventilation design? Or if it's something that doesn't fit one of these categories, please uh, choose other and type it into the chat. We do keep track of these responses for our own uh, future planning. It's great to see what sorts of uh, professionals we're attracting to the calls and what kind of variation in audience that we're getting. So appreciate you all contributing an answer here. And as we get all of the answers rolling in, we'll see the responses pop up on screen in a moment. A few more answers still waiting to come in. Almost there, I think. And there we go. Okay, so good representation from the builder, renovator, and developer 
uh, fields today. A few engineers and architects on staff are on the call. Uh, great, some energy evaluators on the call, some site supers and other site staff, and some building officials and inspectors. Excellent, some some good uh, representation there, and even a couple other radon professionals. So some peer support there for you, Bruce. So that's good to see. Thank you, everyone, for your participation in that. And without further ado, I'm going to stop sharing my screen for today and uh, hand it over to Bruce, who will take us through the main content for today. Take it away, Bruce. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, everyone, for, for having me. Uh, Mark, you had uh, mentioned that the next presentation is about uh, energy tightness and uh, big exhaust appliances. So it's important to realize that as we move towards buildings that uh, are more airtight, and especially if we're exhausting a lot of air from those and not balancing it properly, that can exacerbate the radon problem. So um, so radon in part nine. Now, I realize this is a national uh, presentation, so I, I didn't hone down into any specific province or, uh, or territory. So we're going to talk about some basic principles of radon um, resistant new construction and the CGSB requirements out there, Canadian General Standards Boards. Uh, but before we get started, I consulted for a lot of uh, homeowners in the Guelph area or home builders in the Guelph area. And I've, I've seen some builders struggle a lot with, with this um, unnecessarily. So I'm hoping that uh, we'll be able to, to, to solve some of the challenges you have and, uh, and move forward from there. And my, con my contact information is at the end of the presentation. So I'm open to, uh, to questions. Um, but I no longer do that consulting. I do um, radon testing and fixing for BGIS, which is a largest property management firm in Canada. So unless you own a bank or a telecommunications uh, building, I have nothing to sell you. So this is just knowledge that I'm trying to impart and help. Okay. Oop, there we go. So why is this important and why should builders care? Well. If we do this right, this can save you money, time, and, and a reputation. Um, for radon, uh, it poses a liability and financial risk to builders. And if you're in Ontario, um, it's covered under the Tarion Home Warranty Claim for up to seven years uh, under major structural defect. So if, if you have to go back and fix it after, it costs you know three to five times what it is for you guys to do this during construction. Um, so that's that's a concern right right there um it's far less expensive to implement a proper control during construction than to fix it after you get to implement the cost of the rate on construction and that gets passed along to the buyer right whereas if you don't do that then it's coming purely out of your profits so that's not a place you want to be um there's money and time as well. If you have a homeowner and their radon's high and you're trying to, to fix the house, you're spending a lot of hidden costs with your admin staff and, and your, you know, your technical staff going out to site trying to solve this problem, where if you implement a good radon program, good radon resistant program, it's very, very simple to deal with this rather than running around trying to sort out the problem. Not only that, if you have to go back and fix it, um, it can be very disruptive to the owners. They're already now upset that they have high rate on. They're upset you have to come in and start to do more work in their new home, which in their mind should have been right in the first place, even though this isn't really your fault. Um, and then they might not be happy with the aesthetics of the system. So you, nobody wants a dissatisfied homeowner. Um, you know, and if it's poor response, high rate on, you don't want a bad reputation as a builder, right? And again, this isn't really about builder reputation because it's not, radon's there, it's not your fault. It's just how we manage it in the future. Um, and if you do it right, you can market yourself as uh, a builder that builds healthy homes, which is what everybody's after. So I don't know how experienced everyone is with radon. So I'm gonna do a quick radon 101. I might move fairly fast through these slides, but uh, again, we can, detail with questions, because I'm sure you all have some idea of what this is about. So quite simply, radon's radiation. Um, it's just radon is a radioactive gas that can seep into your homes. So that's why it's sort of hidden. It's the leading cause of lung cancer in non-smokers, kills 3,000 Canadians a year. So on average, eight people 
a day die in Canada from radon induced lung cancer. You can't see it, smell it, or taste it. It's present in every building that touches the ground. And from my experience, that's all of them. Um, and it comes from the natural decay of uranium in the soil. And there's no way around it. The uranium's everywhere in the soil. So it's going to be there. Um, and then what happens is when it gets inside the building and the occupants inhale it and they have an internal dose of radiation, which is worse than an external dose. Another silent killer we have that we're probably more familiar with is carbon monoxide. Um, we wouldn't dream of having a house without a carbon monoxide detector in there, but radon kills, you know, roughly a thousand times the people. Um, and the compliance on radon is low, probably because they don't know. Um, now, absolutely, if uh, you have a carbon monoxide problem, it is a tragedy because you can unfortunately kill a, a family of four. The, un, the thing that's not realized is if you have a radon problem in that building and it goes unchecked, you'll still kill the, the occupants of that building. It'll just be spread out over 100 years, but you'll unfortunately affect every other occupant in that building forever. So radon is much higher risk, much higher toll. Um, other thing, too, is even though radon's naturally occurring, the high levels inside is not and the high levels inside a building are caused by how we design build and occupy our homes so how does it get in the lion's share is the stack effect that drives it it pulls it in so we know the stack effect is warm air that rises up through the house just like through a chimney find its way out through little holes in the roof and the upper floors and that puts a suction on the lower floors and in the basement it's not very big Maybe a, a one one thousandth of an inch of water column, not a lot, but that's more than enough to pull the radon in. That's where the lion's share of the radon comes from. You might hear about it coming from marble uh, or, or stone materials. That's not the case. The bulk of it comes from the soil. An imbalanced HVAC system can also depressurize the house and suck in radon, although that's not as common, especially in quality builders. And groundwater wells do sometimes bring in radon. But again, it's very, very small. The lion's share is from the soil. So that's the key thing to remember. So to visualize it, picture on the right is my sump pit at my house and you can see the air being pulled in. So it's there, it's very visible. That's, that's a fair bit of air. And the picture on the left is where some smoke's been injected underneath the slab. And the, the smoke, which is the same as soil gas or radon, is coming in through the cold joint where the wall meets the slab. There might be leak by there, but this could just be a normal size crack. So all the smoke you see there, that's, that's the radon that would be coming in. This, this slide is rather interesting. What does it look like just to help visualize radon? What's happening here is radon, um, rich air is being put into a cloud chamber. Um, and so what you're seeing, every little streak you see there is a radioactive disintegration. So every one of those would represent a tick on a Geiger counter. So this is what you would inhale if you're inhaling radon. And then every one of those little streaks would be uh, a radiation, ionizing radiation, alpha primarily, that's damaging DNA inside your lungs. So... Now, a lot of people say, eh, radon's not a problem here. I get that a lot. Show me a map. Tell me where it is. Well, there is a radon potential map of Canada, and this is based on potential for soil um, representing a high source of radon. And as you can see, there's some pretty red zones in Canada. So it's divided into three zones. Red is high, green is elevated, and blue is guarded. Think of it like high, medium, low. But the reason why we don't use low is because in the States, they, they did that and everybody said, oh, I'm in a low area. I don't need to test. I don't have an issue. And people were being overexposed to radon. The soil and the amount of uranium and radon in the soil is definitely a key factor in how much gets into the house. But it's not the only one. There's so many factors that affect the amount of radon indoors that you don't know unless you test. You have to test. So... The, the map manufacturers, as well as Health Canada, are very, very, very clear that the only way to know is to test, and you cannot use the map or any other study to tell you you don't need to build radon. 
uh, out of the building. And if we know that in Canada, roughly 80% of the most highly um, and densely populated areas are in places of elevated radon, there you go. So um, radon's measured in these things called becquerels per cubic meter of air. A becquerel is a nuclear disintegration a second, so a tick on a Geiger counter. So um, in Canada, the action level is 200 becquerels per cubic meter. Anything above that you need to fix. Anything below that is considered acceptable. U.S. is a little more stringent. If you're above 200 becquerels, Health Canada recommends that you fix the building or the home in this case within two years. And if you're above 600, they suggest you fix it within a year. So, you know, that's 200 nuclear disintegrations, pop, 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 off a guide counter every second in a cubic meter of air. So let me, if that helps you, put it into a visual. But like any other cancer causing agent, as low as reasonably achievable applies because there's no such thing as no risk. There's always some risk associated with radiation. Every time you cut your risk or cut your exposure of radon in half, you also cut your risk in half. So if we can get it down to zero, or which we really can't do, but we can get it down to background, which is roughly in the tens of Becquerel's range, that's as healthy as we can get it. When we do tests, if some of you have done some testing, you might wonder you know, how the testing happens. And what we do is we, you always measure in the lowest occupied levels of the rooms in a house where an individual spends four hours a day or more. So if you have an unoccupied basement or an unfinished basement, you don't need to test there unless you intend to uh, convert it or finish it into you know, bedroom or office space or something. So in that case, you would test in the basement, but otherwise you test on the main floor. Uh, even if a building slab on grade, you still have to test. So you would test on the ground floor in that case. Now, radon does fluctuate quite dramatically throughout the hours and the days. So what Health Canada wants to make happen is they want to make sure you're getting a representative sample of your exposure. And so the testing period for radon is your test over a three-month period. You can test up to a year, but three months is the minimum. And you want to do that over the heating season because radon tends to be higher indoors during the heating season. If you take a lower or a shorter reading than that, you can get a false high and go and spend money fixing a problem that you really don't have. But from a health perspective, there's greater concern that if you take a short-term test and you get a biased low result, then you think you're not exposed and you don't do mitigation and you continue to be exposed, you put yourself at risk. So um, builders, if you have a situation, you can't do a two day test or a one week test to solve your problem. Um, you can use that for some diagnostics to kind of help figure out where you are and what to do, but you can't use that to, uh, to solve a problem. It has to be a three month test. The short term tests we do immediately after we fix a building, just to make sure we got the levels down where we wanted to. And then we always follow up with a long-term test. But remember the 200 Becquerels is an average annual weighted exposure. So we want the average that we're exposed to and that long sample period levels out the, the peaks and valleys. This is typically the test device we use. It's called an alpha track detector. It's two pieces of plastic. I know I'm really selling the high tech here, but this is the best technology that, that we have. Um, and it's it's very sound, it's solid state. It's, uh, it doesn't rely on electronics at all. It's, it's a physical measurement. So inside that detector, the radon seeps in just like it would sort of seep into your lungs, so to speak. And then there's a, a specialized plastic film, very similar to uh, the same thing they make eyeglasses out of. And the radon, when it decays, the radiation actually punches holes in that that clear film on the right you see there. And then it's sent to a lab and it's it's analyzed under a microscope and then they convert that into reading for you. A lot of builders and people say, come and test the area and, and ask, you know, tell me if there's high rate on before I build here so that I don't have to put in a system. You can't do that. Um, it's not cost effective at all. Um, so there's no way to really accurately estimate how much indoor radon you're gonna have in a building. You have to build it, build it resistant, test it, 
And then if it's high, go to the fix. Okay. So that's radon 101. Now I'm going to get into how we control radon. I'm just going to touch on the basic principles of it. And then from there, we'll go into the radon resistant new construction. So the first thing we want to do is limit the radon ingress. And we want to try and do that by sealing. Try and, and make the air barrier, the continuity of the air barrier, solid. Because we want to stop that soil gas leakage into the building. Because we know that's the lion's share of how radon gets in. We don't worry too much about diffusion because it doesn't seep through concrete a lot. It's really that, that bulk soil air pulling into the building that we're worried about. Next thing we want to try and do is decouple the indoor air from the soil, right? So that the, the building isn't, you know, hoovering on the soil. And we can do that with a full height rough in, and we'll get into that in a little bit more detail. But if we minimize that pressure differential across the slab that pulls in the radon, we can minimize its, its ingress. If that doesn't work, we want to reverse the radon ingress. So we take that piping that we've exhausted outdoors and we put some suction on it. So we put some suction underneath the slab of the basement. So instead of the radon getting sucked into the house, we suck a little bit of conditioned air underneath the slab and stop it from getting in. Very effective, the most effective. And then, of course, you can use ventilation where you're basically diluting the radon. So Dilution can be the solution to pollution, but it comes with a whole bunch of challenges as well. Okay. So your, your presentation is going to have this in it, so you can go into a little bit more detail. But sealing, it's typically, there's some pros and cons here. It's inexpensive. You guys are familiar with how to do it. Um, if you seal large openings, you get rid of a lot of the radon, or you can, you can minimize a lot of the radon, and there's no energy. Um, costs associated with fixing that. The co the cons is extremely tedious. Um, you might not have access to all the openings um, and it's virtually never 100% effective. So, but you want to try and seal it because it'll make the rest of the systems more effective. Decoupling, which is a passive stack. Think of it a lot like a, a sanitary sewer stack, right? That goes up through the house. M moderately effective fairly low cost, no energy required, um, and it's easy to convert to an active system, which is something that you guys should be considering. We'll explain how that really helps you through your process. Cons is it's only moderately effective, but it's more complex. Active depressurization, um, which is that suction underneath the floor slab, extremely effective, reduces 99% of the radon, 99% of the time, basically. Um, huge reductions or large reductions in the radon concentrations, controls it at the source so it never gets into the house, so people aren't exposed to it. Fairly low energy consumption. It's only like a 30-watt fan, typically, so that's like leaving a light bulb on, um, but a little bit more to install. It does require powder to operate. Um, you lose a tiny bit of conditioned air out of the building. Um you have to insulate some pipe when it goes outside so it doesn't freeze up. Um, and there's some minor maintenance. And by minor maintenance, I mean maybe changing a fan in 15 to 20 years. So not a lot. And ventilation, uh, when radon first came out and there was issues, everybody said, oh, just put an HRV and you're fine. Ventilate, put an HRV, you'll, you'll be fine. My, my house had an HRV and it still blew over. Um, so that's a challenge. You can buy dynamic systems that do pilot um, HRVs to ramp up ventilation when the radon comes in. Um, so that can be a, a use for you. Um, but there's some additional cost with installing that. A um, little bit, there's less disturbance to the building, which is a, a pro. Um, but remember, if you want to cut radon in half, you have to double the air changes. So maintenance of this can be an issue. I have yet to see anybody other than myself or anyone on this call who maintains their HRV the way it should be maintained. Most people unplug them or let the filters clog up. And at that point, it's doing nothing. Okay. So, all right. So the key thing is a lot of people thought, well, let's just seal the radon out and it won't get in. Um, 
I'm going to just tell you right now, virtually it's impossible to seal out radon because all you need is one centimeter square opening with all the holes added together in the basement for it to not be effective. If you don't believe me, uh, National Association of um, Home Builders Research Center did their own study and found the same conclusion. Um, they found that it was um, difficult to maintain the construction quality of the ceiling. Um, they found that a lot of the, the caulking details, just people didn't have enough knowledge of it or were overlooked by people uh, and building trades. And it was a low priority for the builders at the time. So don't try and seal it out because it's not going to work or don't think sealing it out will work. So what do we do? This is the typical um, active depressurization system. If we have high radon in an existing home, what we would do is we would core a small hole through the, the floor slab, as you see with my mouse here, dig a little soil pit to activate as a, to, to act as a plenum, put a pipe in the ground, put an inline fan and exhaust it to the outside. The one on the left is a sidewall discharge. The one on the top is, is a rooftop discharge. And this is generally what they look like. The one on the bottom is the system in my home. So it can be done quite neatly. Um, but that is sub-slab depressurization system. And that's what we want to get your homes either built as or that if you have a problem, installing this system is very, very easy and very, very cost effective. So a little bit of planning at the beginning makes this very easy and very inexpensive. Not planning in the beginning makes this extremely expensive and extremely hard. So I talked about this a little earlier, so I'll sum this up really quick. You can constantly try and dilute the ventilation, but again, homeowners just gonna not maintain their HRV and that, that'll be a problem. Um, and the dynamic ventilation, these systems work great. Um, you have to make sure that your HRV will be piloted by this system, but also realize too that it triggers at 150 becquerels, not 200. So um, if your client or the region wants you to get down to 100 becquerels, you'll never get there with this unit or it's unlikely. Okay, So now we get into radon in new construction. So how do we take these basic principles of the radon resistant or the radon fix that I just talked about, the active pressurization, and how do we build that into our buildings while we're building it so that it makes it easy? And that's where we get into the details of it. National Building Code, uh, it has measures in it for radon resistant new construction. It might not be called radon resistant new construction. You might have another term like readily remediable new construction but basically it's the same thing. We wanna build that house ready to fix if we have a radon problem. And what does it call for? It calls for granular layer under the slab. So this is usually clear stone. And what we're trying to do there is have a, an air layer that's air permeable underneath the slab so we can suck all the radon out from underneath the footprint of the building. That's what it does, okay? We wanna put, we wanna try and seal the slab with a membrane. And this is usually polyethylene over top of that granular layer. Okay, it's a bit of a diffusion control, but it also helps stop concrete from dribbling down into the gas control layer and makes it more effective. Also, if the floor cracks, then there's at least some plastic underneath it to maybe help minimize, um, you know, a bulk opening where all that radon is going to come through. We want to seal all the cracks and joints. So that's penetrations through the floor and the wall with, with caulking. We want to have a rough in pipe to start um, to put in the, the rest of the pipe if we need to. Um, it can go in the interior of the home. Um, sometimes it can go on the exterior of the home, depending on which standard you're following, um, but it needs to be capped and sealed. Uh, you don't want that where somebody can open it and allow the radon to come in and of course seal a sump pit. Now, when you get to the provincial and territorial level building codes, they do change from province and territory, but they even do change from jurisdiction. So. You know, you need to really focus on what your building officials are, are are enforcing, but the principles are the same. So I want to talk about the principles more so, uh, because regardless of what they're asking, the principles are the same. In some of the additional measures you might find is a soil gas barrier on the walls. So I know that uh, it's typically called for bituminous tar, which is a spray on, and it's supposed to be a diffusion control. And that's all it's going to do. 
if it cracks or the building or the foundation wall cracks, you know, the typical tar that you put on isn't going to do anything. However, if you use the rubberized sealant or uh, trim proof 260, um, particularly trim proof 260 with a co-spray, they'll ask about a co-spray and basically I think it's calcium chloride solution they spray with it. It turns that same, you know, uh, just wet tar into a rubberized type finish that will seal gaps and cracks. So if you're a builder and you have to do this, and you want to keep right on out, look up trim proof 260 and ask them to use the co-spray. Some places in BC, depending on where you are, uh, actually require a full passive stack. Um, some of the requirements uh, you might need to test for radon. For example, in, in Guelph, Ontario here, um, and in various places in Ontario where uh, a certain building code SB9 isn't uh, enforced. Systems need to be labeled depending on where you're at. So people know what's a radon pipe and some, some places require active systems. So in Ontario, Guelph started out with implementing a, a radon management program in their new builds. And strictly all they did was look what the duties were in codes for builders. But they spelled it out in a program so that it was easier for the builders to follow because the builders were, the way the code was written wasn't clear on the science and where it was at. So Guelph implemented a system and all these other areas followed suit. Okay, with the exception of the three at the bottom which were mining communities and have had radon control in their building code for decades. And British Columbia also has their own uh, requirements and systems. Okay. Now, Canadian General Standards Board has two radon standards out, but they recently did uh, changes to them in the draft throughout. They're being under, uh, They've been reviewed and they've gone back to the committee for review. So I'm going to go over what's in the draft so that you can, you know, experience what might be coming in CGSB because it's it's expected that many of the codes will start to just reference CGSB as the, the mechanism for radon resistant construction. So there's the draft codes right up here, CAN CGSB 149.11 which is the new construction, okay? And it basically breaks radon resistant new construction into two categories. Level one, which is a rough in that's just a stub, which we see on the, on the right here. So you don't run the pipe all the way out, but it's there and ready to use if you need it. So you have your gas permeable air, you have your gravel under the slab, you have your membrane underneath the, the slab, you have the cap, sealed, identified, ready to go. And this cap can be inside or outside, but it has to be sealed, okay? The next one is the full height, which is running up the entire building through the condition space out to the roof. So it acts very much like a sanitary stack that would vent sewer gases out. This acts as a mechanism to vent radon out and it decouples the building interior from the soil, right? We find these systems to be about 50% effective, 50% of the time, depending on what you read. They can be quite effective. If I'm gonna recommend anything to a builder, I recommend doing level two. Because what happens is with all the best intentions and all the best purpose, builders put in level one. And I, I've seen this in, in my community, they put in the level one, they thought radon wasn't going to be a problem. They didn't think how they were going to get it out from, you know, the, the spot they put it in to the exterior. And it was a bunch of townhomes and it's literally like two blocks from my house. Incredibly good builder. Um, they put them in. They put them in under the staircase in the mechanical rooms and you just couldn't get at them. But being a townhouse, all these staircases and mechanical rooms were kind of in the center of the townhome unit. So then you had, and the basements were finished. So then you had to, if that building was high, which it was, now you had to move that or get that pipe to go through the finished basement and out to the, the sides of the house. Well, we couldn't vent outside the front and meet the clearances because there was a garage and windows and and a porch there but then when we went out out the back there's a door 
a window well and another window. So to meet the venting requirements, it had to do this jog pattern halfway up between the ground floor, the ceiling of the ground floor and below the windows of the second floor. And so they had, they had these just ugly pipes um, or they had to go through the roof. So how do you do that? If you hadn't put, put the pipe all the way through to the roof, now you're trying to find a route and you're ripping apart kitchen ceilings. You're putting this through a closet, trying to build in a bulkhead, um, extremely disruptive, extreme amount of additional work where if you had a thought, okay, rather than putting in this stub, if I run the stub all the way up and put in a full passive system, I have control where the stack is. It's already there. I'm probably going to get a great reduction to begin with. And if it's high, all I have to do is throw on a fan. So my recommendation is, is level two, just it makes economical sense for most builders. So if after you do level one or level two, the building is high, you would go to the next CGSB standard, which is 149.12. And the only thing that would apply to you if you're building a new building here is how to size the fan. And there's processes in there to tell you how much flow and how much pressure the fan needs. So that's it in a nutshell. This is a flow chart of the standard, just for a visual on how the systems work. I'm not gonna get into too much detail in the interest of time. But the CGSB requirements, again, same basic principles for radon control, have a gas permeable layer or a way to collect that gas, that soil, that radon, soil gas from underneath the floor slab. You wanna get the entire building basement floor slab. So you need a way to let that air move. And if you put it on compact wet clay, you can't suck the air through it, right? Soil gas barrier, they do specify 10 mil versus six mil poly, just because it's more resistant. A suction pit, as you remember, there's that little pit that we dug out on the, the uh, active system that I showed you. So you want to put that suction pit in your gravel construction so you're ready for it. And it can be a pipe with holes in it. It can be a cage. I'll show you pictures later. Or you can excavate a pit. Seal the entry points. Put in a rough in pipe. And uh, it's 100 millimeters or 4 inch diameter pipe is the minimum. And fan if the building tests over. So here's some details out of the CGSB drafts, typically what they look like. You can see here's the just the basement rough in where it's sealed. Um, you can see the, the gravel at the bottom here. You can see the little suction void here. So I'm pointing with the mouse. That's where your cage would go. And you can run pipe to wherever you need your, your suction point to be. Ideally, you want to try and put this in the center of the building so that you get a nice radiating pressure field across your, your slab. You don't want to put it too much in one corner. You want to try and even things out a little bit. But it doesn't have to go in the center. Sealing the, the joints and the penetrations. You can see with some caulking where these red dots are. And there you go. You can put it all the way out to the sidewall. Again, but if you do this and it's not an active system, you have to seal it, okay? Because if you get wind blowing in, it will actually pressurize under the slab and push right on out. So if you do this, you have to have a sealed cap on it, okay? So either of these are effective and very easy for a builder to implement properly and well at the beginning. Saves you a lot of time and a lot of money. And this gets passed on to the homeowner when you sell the home, as opposed to coming out of your profits. This is the full height passive stack. Again, the one that I recommend um, the most. Everything else from the previous slide is the same, except it goes all the way up through the roof and it vents to the atmosphere. And yet insulate in the attic space. So you're going to get some reduction from this right away. Um, and if it's if the building is high, you just crawl in the attic, put in a fan after you size it properly, and you're done, right? And if you budget it right, you can put in the cost for the purchase of the home to include having to go back and put in a fan. So you're already covered there if you've got that money in there. You carry 500 bucks, 700 bucks per house, whatever you decide. Um, you'll win on some. Actually, in that case, you'll win on them all. 
right? One of the nice things about the CGSB, uh, the new CGSB standard is it came up with a lot of different details on how to seal underneath the slab or where that cold joint, where the floor slab meets the wall. Um, a lot of different building examples. Uh, I just pulled out two here. Um, very different if you've got uh, the insulation on the wall required to be a thermal break, which is code in a lot of places. Um, how do you put, if you put a bead of caulking right, right there at the slab, you've still got a hole in the back. So how do you deal with that? So they thought out a lot of different ways to, to manage those. So you don't have to dream it up on your own. These are great options for you. Um, what I prefer to do, and this is, this is just me, um, I've used spray foam extremely effectively in, in many of these situations before. Uh, Kafka, the Canadian Urethane Foam Contractors Association, has a system, the radon control system, that um, it, it basically follows the principles of radon resistant new construction. You can take a course, you can become certified in it. And the spray foam, instead of insulation underneath your slab, or, you know, um, bulk insulation, a panel insulation on your wall, the spray foam becomes your radon barrier, your air barrier, and your vapor barrier all in one shot. And you get your thermal break on your foundation wall all in one shot. You don't have to go around and seal any of the penetrations because the spray foam does that for you. So your unit cost might be higher, uh, but the efficacy is incredible. Um, and uh, the, the big benefit with this is there is a CACMC number and it is ULC underrated uh, or underwritten, sorry. Um, you know, but if this isn't the system you like and you don't want to use it, that's fine. But I do find this to be extremely effective. Um, when you spray uh, high density two pound closed cell foam at, you know, two and a half inches nominal to get your vapor barrier and your air barrier, you're, you know, 60 to 100 times more effective than poly as a radon barrier. So very good system worth considering. There are also Kafka certified radon contractors that can do both. Uh, this is an old detail out of CGSB um, and some people might still reference it, but it shows the poly finishing up above the top of the slab on the wall. Um, my personal advice is just never do this. I think it's the worst detail ever. That's my personal professional opinion. Um, but what happens is you have a pathway where the poly comes up the wall. And if this tape fails or the poly degrades over time, you now have a direct pathway that's unsealed. And I have yet to see poly laid beautifully, 90 degrees, perfectly taped against a concrete wall. It just doesn't happen in reality. Okay. I just never see that. Uh, I've seen this approach taken. And it's nothing but a nightmare from my experience. Key thing for builders is remember I said you need that gravel to be that air plenum all the way underneath your floor slab. If you have strip footings, you can disrupt your ability to draw from there. So you might have to use piping and go through a strip footing and connect them if you're if you're putting it through one pipe system. Or you might have to put in two radon draw systems, depending on the how the building is constructed, but those are your options. This is an example of what it would look like at the bottom. Um, and when you sleeve through um, strip footings, um, the pictures on top are one of the things I tend to see. Um, you know, you have to take care that you don't crush these materials because you can't rip this stuff out and put it back in later. So, you know, I, I don't suggest you use uh, drainage tile as a sleeve, put in something that can take some weight um, and uh, and resist any any type of crushing. Here's an example of what that system would look like where you've got a two two tier system and a single radon rough in pipe will manage about 3000 square feet. So on a typical house, you're fine. You only need one. But if you've got multiple level footings. For example, on the left, you've got something here that's maybe a, a, a split level home. You've got a higher uh, foundation here that you need to tie into. Well, you can do it with one system. 
And again, that's easier for you to figure out at the beginning than to deal with it later. Okay. This is a great product, Radon X from IPAX. It uh, meets all the, all the standards. It's pre-labeled. Um, it's the right color if you're working in Guelph. Um, they have all the fittings, connections, rain leaders that you want. Um, and it's, it's good to go. So um, really great product. If you're looking for something, you don't have to reinvent the wheel. You've got this, you can put it in and you know, you meet all the requirements. Um, schedule 40, um, gray, gray pipe for again, working in Guelph, all the fittings you need. So and the guys at IPEX are really experienced with this right on bit so they can, they can help. They can't design for you, but they can help get you the products. The other thing you might want to look at are, are cages. And uh, there are some other manufacturers out here, but Radon West uh, builds these ones. And the one on the left you have here for, well, it's advertised for $325 is a simple cage. So you plug this in the middle of the uh, your floor slab. You stick your your uh, IPEX Radon pipe, solid pipe in there, and you you run it up so that you, you can backfill right here. You're never going to crush the cage. You're always going to have a nice big plenum to draw the radon and the soil gas from. It's going to ensure a very effective system um, rather than trying to monkey with your own system or develop something that doesn't get installed right. Things of that nature. So very good product to use. And again, I'm sure you could get the price point down if you ordered a bunch of them. Now, probably I couldn't hear it, but I'm sure there's some builders out there saying we don't have gravel out here in this area because it's too expensive, right? Well, if that's the case, you do have an option. There's this product called Radon Guard and basically it's um, it's sheet foam. Um, and you can see on the left here um, that there's dimples on the bottom. So you put the dimple side down and it provides that, that gas permeable layer where you can move all the air. And the benefit is you get under slab insulation, which is fantastic. And then you can lay poly over top of it or radon guard they have their own um, high-end uh, radon vapor barrier or radon barrier to speak and then you pour your concrete over it and they even have a special designed block to to represent your your draw point or your rough in so that's a good option if gravel or clear stone is too expensive right you can't use pit run gravel it has to be clear stone because if there's too many fines in it you won't pull any radon through Gas mats are available as well. Um, so instead of it covering the whole area, you'd use it to sort of build a loop around the entire uh, perimeter of the house and, and put it in. These are great. They work. They're versatile. Um, usually needs a higher strength fan, though, because they're they're far more uh, resistant to, to soil gas movement, a lot more head loss through these. And, of course, if there's a break in the system, you're not getting the whole area, right? So you want to be able to pull air from every direction without having pipes crushed or, or things of that nature. So some of the pipe details in CGSB, and we I've seen this go wrong. Um, pipes, again, have to be a minimum four inch um, or 100 millimeter diameter. Schedule 40, because they need to be a little bit robust. Um, and you can't have water traps in them, right? So you have to be able to drain water. Remember that you're pulling soil gas out, which is at 100% relative humidity. So you're pulling out liters upon liters of water every day, and that will condense in the pipe. So you have to slope your pipe 1% to drain the water back to underneath the slab and ensure that you don't have any water traps. Here on the top right, you can see the radon pipe at the top, and then it loops down and comes up, and there's the fan there. So they've built this huge U-trap or P-trap, and it's just going to fill with water. And this one's actually going to flood the fan. And these fans are designed to move air. <laughs> They're not so good at moving water. So, um, and again, unless you know that you're moving all that humidity, right, and the water's going to build up, you'll have a problem. I had a builder that did this. They put in a whole bunch of piping and um, cost them $30,000 worth of rework. Um, and they could have called me and I would have charged them like nothing to say, don't do that. So, um, you know, take, take your time and make sure the guys, if they're installing the pipe, know what they're doing. Um, 
There's various materials that you can use in the CGSB standard, ABS, steel, cast iron, copper, but PVC remains um, the most popular for a number of reasons. So that's probably what you'll wind up seeing. Um, they, they recommend using 22 and a half degree fittings, especially if you're doing a passive system, because the less sharp bend you have there, the better the stack effect is going to be to, to, to draft that air and that radon gas up and out. If you have too many bends, it's not going to pull as well. Insulate in unconditioned spaces, because again, you're moving moisture, so you don't want that moisture to freeze inside the attic pipe, okay, and stop the gas from flowing. And uh, they require you to pressure test the stack if you're doing a level two um, to make sure that none of the radon is seeping through a poorly fit joint, okay? And you can do either a pressure test, an air test or a water test, okay? There's some clearances here that are in the CGSB standard when you get to the point where you're exhausting, how far away from a window, um, an air intake, et cetera. I'm not going to go over them in any great detail. You'll find they are basically the same as combustion gas or, or combustion venting appliances. You just don't want the radon to re-entrain into the building. Um, CGSB has, the draft had recommended clearances and required clearances. I think they're just going to go with one because um, it didn't make a lot of sense. But as I mentioned uh, before in um that example where the townhouses from my place um or, or close to my place the the suction pits the level ones were the, the stubs were just put in the middle of the townhouse there was no thought on where they were going to vent out that's where not having that insight and then having to deal with a level one goes horribly horribly wrong right um the builder could have saved themselves a lot of hassle had they just gone with full height rough ins right um, and if the roof if you're going to a roof discharge there's another table for the roof discharge same thing you can look them up if you have a crawl space an earthen crawl space well you don't have a concrete slab there so what you wind up doing is there's a whole spec in the cgsb standard on the uh on how to seal that and basically what you wind up doing is you put 10 mil polyethylene uh, vapor barrier over top of the soil and you have a perforated pipe like the radon x i showed you or a cage underneath the slab so you can exhaust it out uh, and then you just have to seal the poly to the wall um, with caulking and, and mechanical fastening okay And that's how uh, a membrane system would work, right? This is an example of what a crawl space would look like um, installed. This is actually in a commercial building, but it was a good example I had. You can see the membrane down there. On the left, you can see the, the radon pipe that comes in and you can see the, the, the bulge here in the plastic, which is where the, uh, the perforated pipe goes to, to draw it in. And uh, yeah, we were able to drop the radon in this building um, from about 700 to 20. And labeling. If obviously you want the systems to be labeled, there was a horror story of somebody connecting a toilet to a radon rough in. Um, and somebody got called in when the toilet wasn't flushing anymore. So I'm just going to leave that alone because you can all imagine what's happening. Um, but there's, Five layer or five types of labels, the barrier, um, especially if it's on a crawl space, uh, the soil gas collector pipes, the rate on rough in, um, caps, uh, some pit that you'd seal, electric panel, say, hey, this is the rate on fan breaker. And then six, if uh, you actually install a system, uh, you put one on the fan. You can go to CNRPP and you can get pre built labels. Okay. So, now we're in the finishing stages. I'm gonna go over a couple of mistakes we've seen and then some things that work. Uh, had one builder, and this is going way back, they had high rate on. So they thought it was a floor problem. So they ripped up the concrete. They thought it was bad concrete and they replaced it and rate on didn't go down. Then they found out that it was probably leakage around the cold joint. So they chipped out the entire uh, perimeter joint, um, put in a backer rod, sealed it, Radon didn't go down. 
because we we know that the ceiling is not effective. Then they placed a non-conformant system, which was a passive system that was sidewall vented, and the radon went up five times. Why? Because remember, I told you the wind can blow. Well, they pressurized under the slab and blew the radon into the house. So start to add up what that cost is is to you if you're a builder. They hired a certified radon professional who came in and in one day fixed the house for $3,500. So there is value in certification. There's value with finding people that are skilled. Um, so if you're not sure, go to CNRPP and hire a certified mitigator. They're there to help. Very knowledgeable people. Bruce, if I could interrupt you for just a quick second. Yeah. Um, just wanted to let you know that we've got about 14 questions that have come in so far. Oh, so. As we're looking at the time, I just wanted to make sure that we leave enough time to maybe address some of those. So sure. if you'd like to keep going a few more minutes or if you'd rather move to the questions now, uh, you let me know what you prefer. Um, how many more minutes do I have left before my hour? Well, we've got a half hour left on the webinar. So just oh, depending on the amount of time fine. we want to spend I'll answering that. I'll be through that. this in maybe 10 minutes. Five, Good 10 stuff. Minutes. Okay. Max. Excellent. Thank Thanks. you for letting me know. Good stuff. Keep I, going. I get into it. This is what happens when you have self-prescribed radon leak, right? It just, sorry, this is my passion. This is all I do for a living. Okay. So there's two types of radon. Radon that's cracked and radon, or sorry, concrete. <laughs> concrete. The concrete that's cracked and the concrete that's going to crack. Okay. Um, remember I mentioned we see you, you have to use clear stone well here we've had a lot of fines get mixed in with the clear stone so that gravel underneath the slab isn't going to pull a lot of radon so you want to keep the fines out or if you can't get clear stone go with one of the other systems like uh, vapor mat or the radon block uh, very very effective um, radon fans uh, they're meant to go in one way and that's vertically um, I've seen them in sideways. They they don't work well long if you put them in sideways. So don't put them in on the left. Um, I've also seen oversized fans. I've seen undersized fans. Um, the worst I saw was, again, a bu builder didn't hire radon professionals when I had thought they could do this on their own. And they actually welded the PVC pipe directly into the fan. Um not good. Some of the glue dripped in, messed up some of the fans. Yeah, it was it was not a good, not a good scene. Um, here's a really nice rough in. Um, and you can see, you know, they've got the slope really nicely done. A clean out here so that I can test the 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 fan size. And this is where the fan's supposed to go. It's not gonna fit. <laughs> so I don't know where where they're gonna put it, right? Um, so great intent, but just a little bit lacking in, in experience there. Um, if you're building a full height stack or you need a full height stack to go up, remember that four inch pipe doesn't fit inside a standard two by four wall. So that, again, another reason why you might want to go full height stack and do that as you're building right off the bat, because then you save those problems, right? Okay. This one, um, this is one of my favorites. Um, this is from the builder that had the $30,000 worth of piping rework. Um, if there's plumbers in the uh, audience, they're cringing because if you look on the left here, this, this pipe is anywhere but plumb. Um, so it just looks like a poor installation to begin with. You can see that it's not supported um, on the wall at all. Um, and it's actually not really supported on the ceiling. And so the problem with that is if you look at the center photo, it's compressed and buckled the rubber couplings that are supposed to be used to hold the fan in, right? The reason why you do that is then you can just swap out the fans when it comes time for maintenance. But you're you're unnaturally pressurizing it and, and distorting those couplings. So that's a potential leak point. And they did their pressure test like they were supposed to. They used a water test, but unfortunately they did it with the fan in line. So they flooded the fans, voided the warranty and destroyed the fans. Again, just lack experience. So hire a professional. If you're not sure, they can help guide you through it. 
right? They can save you a lot of time and money. This one was a big one. Um, here is the rain on suction pit. And this is normally how they do things in plumbing. According to the plumbers that have told me this, they core the hole where the, the tub's supposed to go. They bust it out so they can move the tub drain in and then they set it and they're good to go. But they never finished it. They never continued the, the continuity of the air barrier. They never filled that hole in. Um, same thing happened here in a the shower. They put the spray foam here to, to stop that plug, but they couldn't get in behind the shower. So it's the spray foam's really not doing much. Um, the problem with these particular builds is the these pipes were put in in the mechanical room with a natural gas furnace. So here, they're basically going to depressurize the furnace and potentially backdraft and pull in carbon monoxide. So that was a big issue, um, but got sorted. But again, lack of experience. Um, leak by, I don't know if you've ever dealt with leak by, but that's a direct pathway to the sub slab. And again, the soil, the rain on gas can come in from there. Um, also, if you've got a, a bond or a thermal break and it's loose uh, sheet insulation up against the edge, again, unless you find a way to detail that it's it's going to come in through there uh, simply running a bead of caulking along here on a wet dirty surface um, without a bond breaker um, and insufficient thickness it's just the caulking is going to fail um, and then we see a lot of that um, poorly consolidated materials um, nice big gap in between in behind the pipe that's up against the wall um, concrete guys aren't too worried about that um, but you as the builder need to be, right? Because you can't get in there and now caulk it. It's very hard. Here's an example of where the poly came up above and finished on the slab. You can see how it's all bunched up in here. Total pathways directly to the soil for the radon to come in, clean through. And too many things in the way now to properly seal that with caulking. Uh, this is a bit of a nightmare foundation um, or um, bearing wall laid on foundation, concrete poured over it, same issue here. Um, tons of ways for radon to enter here. And you just can't seal it. Um, and if you do manage to seal it effectively, it looks awful. The homeowner doesn't like it. Uh, poor caulking jobs. I guess the, you know, the guy with the caulking gun forgot a pipe is a circle. Didn't go all the way around it. Um, and here he just, you just can't get into it. Um, unless they have miniature um, caulking guns for the spider here to get in there. I don't, I don't know how to get into that, that space. Right. Um, and here again, no foresight gone into where to exhaust. So they had a myriad of problems of trying to meet their clearances. Okay. Too close to an H, uh, an HRV intake, too close to a window, had to, had to blast it down. Um, you know, this is just, nobody wants to see this on the outside of their house. You don't have to be a builder or a quality builder to realize this doesn't look right. Things done right. This is a proper caulking job. Very well done. Nice thick bead around everything. Um, nicely prepped floor joint, well sealed. Nicely sealed sump pits. Okay. Um, from radon block, this is their radon guard. This is their, their heavier radon membrane, um, well laid across the floor, um, nice and flat, nice and level. Um, and again, you can see here, it's, it's actually underneath, it's been put underneath the, um, the, the beam and the footing to support it. So there's no weird details there. It's, it's just nicely sealed. Here's one with the damp proofing on the exterior and the, the dimple board. Uh, again, remember I talked about the trem proof uh, 260 with the rubberized coating to manage any cracks. Um, key thing to remember here, I've come across this a lot. Builders have tried to meet the requirements of the damp proofing, which is the tar spray on top of the, the wall. And they said, oh, we have damp proofing. We put in dimple board uh, as a building scientist. Dimple board is a drainage plane. It's not damp proofing. They're two different things. Um, so make sure they're not confused or make sure the language in your local code isn't confusing. Um, 
right? So dimple board will do absolutely nothing to stop radon. So just so you know. Properly vented system. Looks nice. Looks just like a little furnace. Right? And there we go. See, I told you it wouldn't take long. I'm good. Very well done. Yeah, thank you, Bruce. That was fantastic. Tons of stuff in there. Uh, lots of stuff that I've, uh, you know, new to me today. So thank you for sharing all that great content. And we've got some time to get through uh, some really good questions that have posted in the chat. Just sure. a reminder for for everyone that is still uh, still tuned in. Um, we we will not have time to answer hands up. So if you have your hand raised and you'd like to ask a question, please do type it into the Q and A. Uh, and similarly, we're not scanning the chat for questions. If you put a, a question into the chat, please copy and paste it into the Q&A, and we'll see how many of these we can get through uh, right and away. And if we so, don't get through, you can email me. I'm okay with that. <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, thank you. That's great. Thanks for being available for that. Um, so the first question that was asked uh, was about a current radon map. Is there somewhere online to find a current radon map uh, that's accessible, either for free or for purchase? Um, you can go to Karst and get a link to Radon Corp and purchase the map. It's You can't just use it for free, okay? Um, okay? There might be a couple versions floating around there, but it might not be updated, so, right? Okay, yep. Perfect, thank you. Uh, and I think there was a link at the bottom of your Radon Map slide that, that showed... Uh, would take you in the right direction. Yes, at least. and it might be worthwhile for you if you're a local builder, go to them because they have broken it down into province by province and sometimes region by region area. So you can get it at a much more granular um, level. But remember, the map is just a tool. You can't use it to determine not to build radon resistant. Okay. Perfect. Perfect. Great. Uh, next question is How many alpha track detectors do you need for a month test? Um, it's based on the area, how um, where you're where you're building. But if it's a residential uh, home, just one test is all that's necessary for that home. Okay. So you just put out the puck. They look they look like this. <laughs> Sorry, and you just put it out for a month or three months, and that's it. You don't need to get multiple ones. One test. And any advice on that placement for for people? That are if you general? order them. They will send you the list on how to place it, right? And if you again go to Karst, um, C A R S T, which those links will be provided, you can find all the Health Canada guidance on how and where to test. Um, right. I, I just didn't want to get into that because we were talking about part nine, right? So all the resources are there for you to find those details for sure. Perfect. Uh, and we had a question, uh, this was coming, I think, out of Vancouver, BC, but in general, the question, where can I purchase testing equipment? So I assume, to, like the test you just showed, but maybe even more advanced equipment if they're interested. Um, you can, there are professional grade instruments out there, electronic meters, they're usually over $1,000 a pop, so not convenient for doing multiple homes. The electronic meters are great, but they're really more for professionals. Um, the radon, these Whoops, the alpha tracks cost you maybe, you know, 40 to $50 each. Um, and if you go onto the Karst website, C-A-R-S-T, you can find all the links to anyone who provides the alpha tracks, but there's also great places like Air Things and Radon Eye where you can buy detectors. Um, so I would say that's the one-stop shop. If, you, if you're looking to buy anything, get a lab, find a professional, the CAR um, ST website or the CNRPP website. Yeah. Okay, and then we had uh, actually two questions. I think they're both from the GTA area, um, asking about using a, a fan for sub-slab depressurization without a sub-slab membrane. So asking, what has your experience been with only adding the active depressurization without the sealing? Uh, the comment is that forming trades are pushing back on adding the poly is it takes longer for the concrete slab to cure. Mm. I've heard that argument a lot. It takes longer for it to, to, to cure. Um, you know, if you put it down, they're just going to put on their golf shoes and walk across it and puncture holes in it anyway. Um, a sub slab depressurization system can overcome that. Um, but if you're, if you're not putting one in, you're not meeting code you're not meeting best standard practice. So that's my response to that. Um, 
things that are better take longer. Right. So. And, and I would say, you know, what I was thinking as I was watching your presentation today, a lot of my work is to do with air tightness in buildings and air barriers in buildings and the amount of overlap between a well sealed, you know, subs or a well sealed foundation from an air tightness point of view and from a radon ingress prevention point of view seem to overlap substantially. So things like sub slab membranes are going to help your air tightness as much as they're going to help your, your radon barrier system uh, yeah. from an effectiveness point of view. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Uh, the next question is, uh, is there a preference to run the pipe up through the trusses or out the side of the house? Up through the, the trusses? Are, I guess are we this would mean out through the roof or this would be for, it's not, it's not specified, but let's assume it's for a passive system. Okay. Um, all right. I'm, I'm thinking, I'm going to try and hit a few things there. Cause I think there, there, there could be a couple options. If, they're talking about the level one rough in for CGSB um, and you've got the stub just sticking up. That's fine. It, it goes nowhere. But if you go to the, the next level, which is up and out the side of the house and cap it, that's fine. If you go up through the roof and cap it, that's also fine. I, um, It's really up to your preference and how you're going to deal with activating those systems if you need to. Um, they'll certainly both work effectively. Um, but, you know, if you're going to pick between one of the two from a technical standpoint, I look at the cost to run that pipe up another few stories, build it in behind a bulkhead so it looks really great, and just do it as a passive system. Right? Right. As opposed to capping it. It just, it makes more sense to me. Right. Right. And to work as a passive system, the emphasis, as you said, is really on it being vertical and, and as much as possible, not interrupted by anything more than a 22 and a half degree. True. Bend. True. But the other thing you have to also realize is a lot of times if you put in the side vent, right, going out to the side, a used builder says, oh, this makes sense. To me. I'm going to put it out here. Um, but then what does the homeowner do? Do they build a deck there? Do they put the kids um, sandbox there? Right. Do they, you know, do they right. do they finish it or or is it blowing sort of out towards the neighbor's window kind of thing, right? So sure. if it's a roof, and certainly with the, yeah, yeah, with roof certainly discharge, with all the townhouse well. examples that you gave, the townhouses are challenged with those clearances, as you pointed out. So that's another reason to go up to the roof. Exactly, and the pipe looks ugly, yeah. right? So you don't want your fix to look ugly because that's not good on your reputation and. We, we run vertical sewer pipes up all the time with our eyes closed. We've been doing it for decades, right? So running a radon pipe mm -hmm. all the way up through, not that much harder. A little bit more money because right. it's pipe, but right. that's my preferred for my reasons. Great. Uh, the question is, does the city accept passive radon removal system pipe stack? Uh, the level two in the standard is passive, but you show a fan on the graph, question mark. It's not clear uh, where this is being asked from, unfortunately. But Oh, I think they're talking about the slide that I had with Guelph. Um, it, again, does the city accept a passive stack? You have to look at your, your particular area and region. So, you know, if it's a Guelph-specific question or area-specific question, just email me. I'll be happy to answer that the best I can. Um, and that was just the... A good graphic I had at the time, <laughs> so it wasn't necessarily representative of exactly what those cities were looking for. So sorry if that caused some confusion. Okay. Uh, can you use the existing sump pit for radon mitigation? I guess this would be an existing home remediation situation. Yes, that that is an option um, because it'll fly around the drain tile, and that is is done quite effectively a, a lot of places. If you're going to do that, get a, a CNRPP. Um, certified radon professional to help you. Um, I, if I do do it, I prefer to not put the pipe through the top of the sump pit. I prefer to core a hole and tie into the drain tile beside it, simply because any plumber, anybody could come and rip off that sealed lid, not put it back properly. And now they've depressurized the basement and you got some potential backdraft issues or something. So, but yeah, those systems do work. It's it's not necessarily the easiest fix because you can be tying into window wells. So, but it, it can work. A lot of times you're better off just to core your own hole and, and dedicate it to the radon. But 
it is an option, yeah, for sure. Great. Okay, moving right along. Uh, if installing a passive stack, would it not allow air back into the area below the slab and enhance ingress of radon into the building? Not if you do it right. <laughs> it's it's stack <laughs> effect, right? The same, you could argue the same risk with a, a sanitary sewer pipe, right? You're using the heat from inside the house to cause some stack and some upwards draw and draft of that, right? I, mm -hmm. I, I, I don't know the wind blowing vertically downward through through the pipe so and there would have again, to be some odd things going with stack effect for that to work backwards like that right it? and remember if you yeah. have a little bit going back in remember it's an annual average exposure so if you get these little burps of radon ingress but it averages out less over the year you've accomplished okay. the same. yeah great great question so far uh, yeah so far really good uh a question about is the what about fire starting with the spray foam approach used in the presented uh slides and i guess some okay, concern I that you're using that bit. what about what with the spray foam uh fire risk with the spray foam approach so i mean we, we know that urethane foam has to be protected so i assume that would just apply in this instance yeah well yeah it would apply you'd obviously have to meet your your local fire code and if you have to to build a a system over top of that that's fine i've seen people shot creed over top of it as well so you know yes you would obviously have to protect that in accordance to fire code yeah right uh and a related question to do with fire uh someone asked how do you handle pipes passing through fire separations of floors and ceilings oh there's uh fire collars you can purchase that go go right around the pipe i should have shown a picture of that and i have one in my house where it goes out to the garage so okay. um, that's typically how we would do it fire collars aren't that expensive um again just refer to your local your local fire code to make sure that you're compliant with with what's there um right. or you can use in commercial buildings we wind up using a lot of um xfr pipe okay okay um so there you go. Okay. Great. Uh, next up, uh, can you discuss why it is not a good idea to connect a passive or active radon vent stack to the plumbing stack just before it exits the building to limit penetration through the roof? Because they're they're venting different things, right? Your plumbing stack is venting sewer gas, right? And your radon system is venting soil gas so um if you need to activate your system you don't want to actively depressurize your sewage stack right because and i'm sure the plumbing code might have some problems with that so yeah keep keep the system separate i i see what the person's saying but yeah i wouldn't i wouldn't connect the two and then you'd have to tee into it and you'd defeat the stack effect of either one of them by teeing into it because right. you'd have this bend, right? Yeah, seems like a, an attractive idea that at the first start to lizard penetrations, but as soon yeah, as you've you made that to connection- it, you'd be pulling all the sewer as as you gas out, right? you'd probably yeah. smell it. <laughs> <laughs> you probably would, yeah, it would ruin your barbecues in the backyard. <laughs> oh, <Yeah>. man, <laughs> you could have left that out. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, Here's a very specific question. In 2013, Terion made radon a warrantable condition in Ontario. Question one, what changes have you observed in the last decade as a result of this? And question two, what changes, if any, have you observed between Ontario and the rest of Canada? Part of the rest of Canada looking at this. What, have I, what I've seen with Terion is I've seen the claims increase with people's knowledge of their house. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Now, Terion will give the builder first crack at fixing it. And if not, Terion will write a check. And there you go. Um, so I have seen it increase. Um, I'll be honest, I'm not as experienced with what happens with other areas um, of residential building and provinces. Because again, I got out of the residential consulting part of it when I moved over to do the commercial bit. So uh, I'm not as experienced, but if the person wants to contact me, I'm more than happy to try and help put them in contact with anyone who who, who might know that. But mm -hmm. again, Karst has a lot of information that's up to date. Um, so if you go on the website, you might be able to find something there. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm okay. kind of more specific on that one. Sounds good. So follow up if there's more interest there uh, directly yeah. would be great. Yeah, and regardless whether it's covered or not, you know, I, I think... 
legally by default somebody might try to push back to Ontario Ontarian right mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so you don't want to you don't want to be part of the legal case. It's easy to fix this stuff, like rate on resistant construction and activating systems. It's easy, um, and if you build right and you plan for it, it's it becomes routine for you. And makes mm -hmm. a big difference. I, I again, I've seen a lot of builders struggle because they lack the experience or didn't plan ahead. So I, I'd like to see that be eliminated and make it easier for you guys. Yeah. Easier to plan for than react to. Basically. Yeah, be less expensive. Yeah. Okay. Uh, next question: Is six mil poly acceptable for radon in new construction? Um, under CGSB, no, but in um, Ontario and SB nine, yes. So again, it's specific to the jurisdiction, right? And again, I, I I didn't get into that because we tried to keep this national, right? Sure. Yep. But, but again, I can speak to that. Remember that the poly isn't really doing much to stop the radon it's not a diffusive thing it's an air barrier thing right so it stops the concrete it stops the the liquid part of the concrete dribbling into your your soil or your gas collection layer so that you don't plug that up and if your concrete cracks post construction like my floor um you know that poly's there and hopefully makes a little bit of an air barrier so all the radon doesn't gush in so absolutely yeah uh, so follow up to that, actually, similar question. Uh, in an existing house, if you've got cracks in, this, in the foundation or in the floor, what kind of sealant would you use to try and seal those up? Yeah, the current recommended um, one is polyurethane. So any polyurethane caulking, um, anything. I find that a lot of the self-leveling stuff works well for some of the smaller cracks, you know, which manufacturer you want. Um, but you want something that's going to stay so elastomeric um and not dry and, and get get hard so silicone caulking would work um like mm -hmm. a draft sealer as well um but again you want something to stick and something that's going to have a good seal but polyurethane is is the primary one but there's lots of excuse me good silicone ones out there okay and again the seal doesn't have to be perfect because you're just limiting the, the rate on ingress it'll never be perfect so right right yeah right uh, just a couple more questions. We're going to be right on time, I think. Uh, so question about motor location and noise. Uh, can you install the motor in the basement or the attic? Uh, does it matter, you know, functionally really if there's one or the other and how loud are they? Excellent question. Excellent question. Um, you can put the fan in the basement or you can put the fan in the attic. It, it doesn't matter. The fans are actually quite quiet, right? Um, and that's one of the reasons why you want to have a professional help you size the fan and that you want to do your best to seal and, and put all those um, um, collection plenums and all, all the gravel in properly. Because the more effectively you put in the rest of the system, the lower um, flow that you need from your fan, the lower suction you need from your fan. So by nature, the fan's going to be quieter, right? Because you don't want the noise coming back. Um so if it's in a mechanical room in the basement, won't be any louder than a furnace. Like just when the furnace comes on, won't be any louder than that. Um, attic is fine too. And especially with the uh, insulation on the attic, you, you won't hear it. Um, mm -hmm. If you are running pipe through the, um, the building to maybe make it active, one thing that I, I recommend for my clients is to just wrap that insulation around it when you're you're putting it in strictly from an acoustic standpoint, right? Because if you're pulling too much air through that pipe or you've got too many bends through it, you know, you can hear the air moving through the pipe, right? But again, they're right. they're they're reasonably quiet fans. So do your best not to sure. oversize the system by making everything else as efficient as possible and the fan noise won't be a problem. Great. Uh, one last quick comment and one last quick question in the last minute here. Uh, comment uh, came in, dimple boards with CCMC are considered damp proofing, but they are not, as you pointed out, radon gas impermeable. So just a little clarification for somebody uh, there. It sounds like some okay. products might be considered damp proofing, but still not radon protection, which is the main point I think that we're concerned Yeah, with. and I just, I want to be, I want to be careful with that because it's certified building scientist. You know, if you got bare concrete and a dimple board, uh, you know, unless that dimple board is 100% sealed from the soil gas, that humidity is going to equilibrate between the dimple board and the wall. You're going to have vapor pressure there, right? So 
That's an argument. Sounds like another good, another good webinar to topic out. we can get into. But, <laughs> and yeah. very quickly, we only have a few seconds left here, but a uh, question, have you seen radon venting systems that are completely outside the building envelope, venting from below the slab? Is that Yes, possible? and I've had to rip them out. Okay. <laughs> Reason being is it's a huge uninsulated section and it usually freezes. Um, there's an apartment complex close to my house that looks like garbage because somebody designed it really. Um, so yeah, you want to keep them inside, right? Okay. And if if you got any Great. pipe outside, you have to insulate it, right? Great, and that brings us to time. So uh, I just want to say a big thank you, Bruce, for sharing all this uh, with us today. It's a real pleasure uh, to listen to your presentation, and thank you for taking the time to answer all of our questions. Um, just as a parting word for our, our attendees, uh, we do have a building science uh, digest, a builder's digest that uh, Building Knowledge publishes quarterly. If you're interested, it's full of useful information on webinars like this and topics like this, uh, articles of note and, and building science events. You can sign up uh, on our website or you can look in the chat for a link to where to sign up to uh, this, this Builder Digest and like to see uh, as many of you as possible receive this if you're interested. Uh, and that brings us to the end of the webinar today. So uh, thank you everyone for attending. Thank you, Bruce, for your participation. Uh, and we look forward to seeing you all again at the next webinar coming up. I believe it was on November 30th. Check the website for more details and we'll see you all then. Thank Thanks for having me, Mark.